Okay. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? All right. Yay, welcome to my talk. Thank you for coming. I hope you are having a fabulous time at Circle City. Everybody having a good time so far? <laughs> I swear it does. It gets better every year. Okay, so welcome to patching. It's complicated. A bit about me. Um, I'm Cheryl Biswas. I go by encrypted on the Twitters. I work as a strategic threat intel analyst at TD Bank in Canada. Now I'll do the necessary disclaimer. The opinions expressed here today are my own, solely my own, and not those of my employer. The end. Okay. Um, something I'm really excited to be part of is the Diana Initiative. This is a, a mini con that promotes diversity and women in security. And this will be our second year happening during Hacker Summer Camp in Las Vegas. And I encourage and invite you to make it out. And I'd love to say hi to you there. OK. Uh, warning, it, it will contain expletives, because I can do that here. <laughs> Don't tell my kids. OK. And let's get started. Oh my god, 2017, what a year. So we had Eternal Blue. We had Wanna Cry. We had Apache Struts. Not once, not twice, but three times. Yes. And OMFG, <laughs> out of the gate from 2018, Spectre and Meltdown. Now, is that dumpster fire hot enough for you? But on a serious note, WannaCry taught us some very hard lessons about older, outdated, unpatched systems and the risks that they pose to us personally when hospitals got hit by ransomware. They could literally be the death of us. So this is a talk I have wanted to give for a long time, just based on experience listening to people talk about the same series of issues, and then seeing evolution of malware. It's progressing, but we're not. So why patching? First of all, it's a common pain point. It is a pain in the ass. It is a necessary evil. But it's also this source of contention and divisiveness within our community. And there are really no easy answers. I thought that Bruce Potter gave an excellent, eloquent rant on this point at ShmooCon. Who here has been to ShmooCon? He had this to say this year. Just patch your shit. It's not that easy. Now, this is something that, a phrase we like to throw around because, you know, we get angry at the offenders. Hell, patching, that's a best practice. Why the heck wouldn't you do that? And that right there is a big reason for why I wanted to give this talk. Because we have to understand why it isn't happening, why it really isn't that cut and dried. It's an issue around a blame game. And a blame game isn't going to solve things. So for me, this is about the stuff that we don't know. It's about the concerns and considerations of specialized systems, proprietary software, legacy things, stuff that we do not have familiarity with, let alone technical expertise. It's also about the costs of trying to do the right thing and having it go really, really wrong. It's about the business between us, technology, it's about the gap, actually, between us and business. And we've known about that for a long time. So I like what Alan Friedman has to say here. Yes, patches are important. And they are complicated. And yes, they are largely misunderstood. That is a really good starting point for our discussions. Who here basically agrees with that? Show of hands. Who here knows Wendy Nather or follows her on Twitter? I absolutely encourage you to follow her if you don't already. She is a voice of reason in our community, very wise. And what she says here, I agree with. 
All right, so where does it hurt? We know that patching is a fundamental best practice. So why aren't we doing it right? Or in some cases, why aren't we doing it at all? In this talk, I hope to pull in some of those realities and help all of us understand things better that we didn't know before. Just listening to discussions between people, either on Twitter or over beers at local community meetups at conferences like this one, I'm seeing the same symptoms of what essentially is a worsening condition. So I wanted to start with some pain points. It's messy, right? It's like the directions, for example. They're either missing, <laughs> they're vague, or they're just stupid and useless. Who would agree? <laughs> Okay, who, who has had to, who has had issues actually with patching directions like this? You want misconfigurations? Because that's how you get misconfigurations. Or this one. I think it, does it not feel to you like it is the worst game of hot potato ever? Right? <laughs> Everyone's concern is nobody's responsibility. I get talk to, talk to, talk to, till I'm like out the door, which then leads to issues around accountability, right? Not my department, not my problem. Thank you, guys. So, does this sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> no, honest to God, though, does it not feel like this? I would liken it more to ongoing crisis management rather than patch management. But when your patching strategy is so terribly broken, nobody wants to sit down and do a process reorganization. How many people have had to do process reorganizations? And you sit down and you do like the fish tongue diagram or the fishbone diagram or the, whatever the du jour diagram is. <laughs> because honestly, change is hard. You'd rather stick with the devil you know than the devil you don't. You've got time constraints. You've got money constraints. You've got resource constraints. Yes, we have issues. Is yours by chance the vendor? You want to talk about it? <laughs> I. I brought Band-Aids. Anybody need a Band-Aid? Who we'll passed them out? <laughs> I didn't bring suckers, but the Band-Aids will make you feel better. All right, so survey says, hatching sucks, right? <laughs> All right, let's take a look and see what these numbers have to say. This was a very recent survey done by the Ponymon Institute for um, Service now. This is approximately, from, from the numbers of people and a good number of people that they interviewed, how many hours weekly they guesstimate, how many people, and how much cost. So just looking at this, <laughs> and this is, this is how they feel. <laughs> they did say suck, by the way. And this many days. I'll ask you quite pointedly, how many people think realistically most organization, it, m any organizations really can commit to this? I don't think it's that doable. So I have three words for you. Prioritize, optimize, automate. Except it's not that easy. All right, so let's talk about managing releases. Do you remember the good old days when, you know, life revolved around Patch Tuesday? <laughs> no, 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 not anymore. Because now we've got out-of-band releases, right? And then we've got staggered releases. And then we've got previews. 
And then we've got this thing called supersedence. If you can even spell that, let alone try to live by it. And it's a thing, and you do have to live by it. So in addition to that, we have to manage downtime with uptime. And then you have to get sign off and find all the stakeholders and coordinate that and make sure that you've got their buy-in and agreement. And sometimes the simplest thing is the hardest thing, like knowing which releases of what you've got. Is this, are any of these pain points for you currently? Yeah. Me too. <laughs> Shh, don't tell my employer. All right, so we are damned if we do, right? Because, yeah, stuff breaks and it goes, stuff goes wrong. Just ask anybody who's had to live through the recent joys of applying meltdown inspector patches on their system and watching stuff break. However, if you follow Swift on security, and I will be willing to bet most of you do, they have pointed out on numerous occasions the necessity of patching, that it has to be a given. So it comes down to this. What is the cost you're willing to pay for the prevention, that ounce of prevention? Can you live with it? And then we're damned if we don't. And this is true too, very true, right? Because while it may feel like the cure is worse than the disease, after you watched the wildfire that was WannaCry blow through most of the globe, you know what the risk is you take with outdated and unpatched systems. It was a huge wake-up call for everyone, but in particular for people who were on Windows XP, who had let patching essentially lapse for any number of reasons. But this is compounded by some very dangerous assumptions out there, assumptions about targeting and attacks. There is, um, I'll call it a head in the sand perception of, why would they want to come after me? Why would I be a target? To which I would say, it isn't like that. You're not actually a target. You are a victim because your systems are vulnerable. So don't be a victim. Now, last May, Wendy Nather, Nather had a really interesting uh, tweet thread going on about enterprise and organizations and their issues, their actual issues around why they don't patch. And if you can dig it up and look through it, I think it would resonate with you. But the fact is, it's an ongoing issue. It's not changing. It's going to get worse because the threats we face, the malware we have to deal with, the complexity of exploits are continuing to evolve. So how do we learn to work with our organizations based on the past to make this process a less bitter pill to swallow? And we know, we know from experience, the patches are not perfect, which is why you need to have a process in place. Okay, and then, yeah, there are those patches that don't quite get it right. They don't hit the mark exactly. Case in point, Cisco. Cisco has not had a very good year. And back around the end of January, they issued a patch. Does anybody remember that? There was a laundry list of Cisco devices. Oh my freaking God, it was terrifying. Yeah, and, and it was for a severity 10. I think there was more than one, actually. That's kind of unprecedented. That was really serious fucking shit, sorry. And <laughs> a week later, Cisco was issuing another patch because they hadn't quite completely patched the first one. Now, we all know what happens when you make it public that there is a, a vulnerability, especially if it's like a zero day or that critical on like globally used systems, right? The attackers are, are they're waiting in the wings. They're going to go after this. They had a week to work on that. 
don't think they didn't take advantage of it. Yeah, that patch got issued, but what happened in the interim? And this has been ongoing through the year. It has not been a good year for patches. There have been more instances of, oops, we have to do that again. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> Meltdown and Spectre. I would have brought a bottle of Tylenol for all of you too, but I don't think I'm allowed to do that. <laughs> OK. Patching is not a silver bullet, particularly in this case. And it seems like every month brings fresh drama, right? So it's not about the loss in terms of processing speed already. That, every write-up is about, well, if you patch it, it's going to be slower. Yeah, but if we, <laughs> if we patch it, it's patched, right? <laughs> it's not, <laughs> right? And as long as we patch it without breaking more stuff. But the problem is it's not going well as a process, not at all. And my concern is for some other systems, ICS and critical infrastructure, that are also affected by this. Because <laughs> this is like a planet killer in terms of almost everything we use was impacted by these vulnerabilities, right? Well, ICS and SCADA and critical infrastructure tend to be proprietary systems, legacy software, stuff that when things go wrong, it goes down hard, doesn't come back up. And then you have major power outages and worse. Oh my god, it's a total meltdown. <laughs> Who actually had systems break because of total meltdown or had to deal with this? So what happened in a nutshell was that um, Putting the patch on for Meltdown actually revealed or created a new vulnerability in Windows 7 systems. And oh, <laughs> it was bad, <laughs> very bad. And again, something for attackers to actively and quickly exploit. And what essentially happened was, because we were looking at um, reading from kernel level at uh, 120 kilobytes a second, go to reading system wide at gigabytes per second. Oh, oh, but better. In addition to that, there was write access. If it, I can't even, no. <laughs> that was a big oops. So yes. Does anybody listen to Defensive Security Podcast? Jerry Bell? Yes. So he is, as you know, a connoisseur of dumpster fires. <laughs> and he sums it up very, very well with this particular statement, the one that's at the top that I didn't circle. The complexity of patching this thing correctly is going to provide many years of quality post-exploitation privilege escalation. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's true. So the question to us is, are we ready for what we know is coming? Do we have rollback points? Do we have backups? And have we tested those backups? It's the same protocol we say for ransomware, but essentially it should be part of any change management process in place, certainly for patching. So for me, the hard lessons that we are actually learning because of Meltdown and Spectre are about the price that we were willing to pay for speed and performance in what was essentially a buy now, pay later arrangement. Only at the time, we didn't read the fine print, and now we're getting served the bill. But this is really a constant refrain in, in what is like a tug of war between security, IT, and business. It's about uptime, and it's about Innovation, and it is about that damned race to the finish line and security be damned. So, just saying, but I think that when, well, when doing things the right way gets called into question, we need to question the process. Oh my God. Oh my God, IoT. <laughs>
<laughs> you guys say more, right? Oh, so many things. Why? Why is it that everything we make has to connect? Oh, but it does, right? Everything. So there's this ongoing race for the next connectable consumable, and security gets tossed by the wayside. We've got, <laughs> if we're lucky, default passwords, hard-coded ones, if we're not. <sighs> and if there's a glitch in the firmware, well, you can pretty much forget trying to fix or update that, right? So from industrial webcams to <laughs> Soho hopeless routers, <laughs> botnets unite, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> to like freaking crockpots. We are talking, I kid you not, legions of doom. Sorry, but set it and forget it is not a security best practice. OK. <laughs> so did you, does anybody have the Nintendo Switch? And you heard about the, the issue, the patching issue. Did you actually successfully update it or fix it? <laughs> no. Right. It's, you know, it's child's play. But we keep building this stuff, right, that we can't fix. Have you ever tried asking your neighbor to update the default password that comes with their cable modem? <laughs> I have. It did not go well. <laughs> so how the, heck, how the heck are you supposed to tell somebody to patch the firmware on their IoT stuff? Okay, I confess, I, I love Die Hard 4. And, and it was really cool, the fire sale part. But I'm also a real follower of ICS SCADA and the people who work in that area. Is there anybody here who is not familiar with the terms ICS SCADA or what I'm referring to? So that's, that's critical infrastructure. It's the stuff that runs our lives. Power grids, nuclear plants, water filtration, um, big uh, gas, uh, gas pipelines and major power plants, transportation. It's in a lot of places, places you don't even consider. Stuff we take for granted. And like I said before, operational tech is proprietary and it goes down hard. Now there's a, a culture within this community, and it's a rather grim one, that you don't touch it, you don't patch it, you just let it die. You run it to failure. And this impacts a lot of us when that thing goes down because it comes from an era when it didn't matter, but that didn't transition to now. So yes, OT is not the same as IT. And 20 years ago, Legitimately, they, they didn't see this coming. So security wasn't something to be baked in at that time because the systems were pretty much segregated, right? It wasn't necessary. They didn't have to do that at the time. However, things have changed and stuff has migrated and things are now getting connected. A lot of things are getting connected and they never planned for this. And what the problem is, is you're trying to patch these crucial systems. It's much harder. So what we need to do is to understand the differences and work with those specialized requirements. There are a lot of endpoints in there, endpoints they never factored in. So let's talk about medical devices. Did anybody get to see the talk by Elena earlier this afternoon? Okay, I would suggest if you, if you have the chance, she's also online, but she has brought to light a lot of <laughs> really code blue issues around medical insecurity. It's staggering. It's terrifying. And these are critical infrastructure, specialized critical infrastructure for critical care. So downtime for patching versus downtime for something that patching broke 
is a really serious issue. Pacemakers, insulin pumps, MRI machines, and other, because we don't know all of the stuff. But this is very particular technology that keeps people alive on a daily basis. There are very hard choices to be made about keeping medical operational technology running. So we don't know how those decisions are made. They're, they're within that community. The people running these are working with a bunch of constraints that we have no familiarity with. They are only just learning now to communicate that out to us. Because they're working under the same kind of constraints that we all do. Resources, budget cuts, politics, bureaucracy. So let's factor that in and try to reach a better understanding of why they wouldn't be patching so that we can actually come at the problem a different way than we've been doing it. Mark Nunikoven was at Atlantic Security Con at the end of April when I was, and he had some interesting points to say about medical device technology and insecurity. One of the um, examples he showed was this pacemaker. So it was recently updated. I went online, checked it out to see what they had to say, because it it's been an ongoing list of things when it, from when it was first introduced. So let's talk about the vulnerabilities. If this was a Windows system, or particularly an Active Directory system, we'd be all over it, right? Because what? We've got authentication. We've got encryption. Yeah. And then how about the fact that you just have to be standing in close proximity to exploit it? That's freaking terrifying. Now, I would love to give a shout out to the people ha who have done so much to raise awareness about insecurities with um, medical devices, particularly uh, I Am the Cavalry, Yelena, Audi, and anybody else who has been part of that team to champion this cause and, and really raise our awareness. So the prognosis is grim, yes, we know that. How do we help the people not get ransomware on the MRI machine and not have to suffer outages to essential systems when they don't have budget or people or time to resolve this. We are looking at vast numbers of outdated operating systems and unpatched systems at risk. Okay. It's the anniversary of WannaCry, one year later. So at the time, 80 of England's 236 National Health Services trusts were infected. And there were 600 more um, general practitioners' offices that were caught up in this. It's, it's more than just an inconvenience. I don't know if people die. Maybe that information was held back. But you, you got to think about how that would impact somebody who had not elective surgery and somebody couldn't take them in at the time when they needed to be cared for. Well, it came down to the fact, and it comes down to the fact, that it's ongoing. There are still many systems at risk getting hit today by WannaCry, even though everybody in the world, my kids knew about it. It was all over the news. So England did a recent cybersecurity assessment of about 200 of these trusts. Every single one of them failed. That's staggering. And you have to stop back and say, why? When you know what can happen, why? And they came back with the reality that we can't fix them. We can't hatch them. We can't change what we have in place because we can't do the downtime. Everything is interconnected. We can't unbundle it, take it apart, and fix just that one piece. We don't know how to do this. Can we figure this out? This is our challenge. 
Does anybody work with mainframes or know much about mainframes? That's probably a good question. Ah, hello there. So it's pretty much a given that mainframes are special cloistered systems unto their own. And, and it's true. Nobody touches the mainframe. It's got a whole culture around it. It's like this, this wonderful little secret world. And they have their own language, like Kix and Jez2 and Rex and all of these other acronyms that mean nothing to outside observers. But the fact is, if you want something kept uptime that's reliable, completely reliable and powerful, you put it on a mainframe. That's why it's at the heart of global finance. 1.1 uh, million transactions per second, per section, and second. And these things really, they're practically guaranteed to stay up. That's why they're in place for the stuff that is the most valuable. However, eventually they need to have maintenance or upgrades, so you schedule outages. You have scheduled outages, because if you don't, you will have unscheduled outages. And I can tell you for a fact, really bad things happen then. And yes, Virginia, you can hack a mainframe, and you should. Now, these behemoths seem like they are impenetrable, but they are vulnerable like any other system. Only you never hear about this. And that's because IBM likes to keep that on the QT. They don't want you to know. In fact, when they send out vulnerability notifications to their customers, there are almost no details. Just, here, patch this. I'm not kidding. Now, I know these guys. Does anybody here follow Soldier of Fortune or Big Indian Smalls? I have huge respect for them. They are masters of the mainframe. And they have made it their mission to open up this cloistered secret world to the rest of us and, and to reveal what the insecurities and flaws are of these massive giants of power. They want to show that these systems are just as vulnerable as anything else we're running and how to do it. So yeah, they literally hack the Gibson. I highly recommend that you follow them and learn a little bit more about them. Plus, they're funny as hell. All right, so with all of this, how, how do we do this better? We know that patching is a best practice, but it is not the only one. So, misconfiguration. It's been at the heart of some pretty ugly vulnerabilities and exploits. But the thing is, that's a human error. It's not a technical glitch. So I would say, let's look at how we're doing network settings, firewall rules, what ports we're leaving open and shutting down. We can manage all of this. And when it's done right and regularly revisited, it's very powerful. It will stop attacks. And then let's talk about the actual business of patching. For example, priorities. Is it me, or have we had an inordinate number of out-of-bounds patch releases just since January? That throws a wrench into any system for any level of organization, but particularly for the, I would consider, far more vulnerable, small to medium-sized businesses who don't have the budget and the resources and the time to cope with it. They barely have a regular monthly patching system in place that they can manage. Trying to deal with something that's out of bands happening every month or possibly every two weeks is going to throw them right out of whack. Boom, more low-hanging fruit, right? Because vulnerabilities get exploited. Who here understands what sequential patching is and why you need to understand it? Do you want to give me, a, anybody want to be a, a guinea pig? Just give me a quick explanation. Exactly. 
You can't just jump ahead. You have to do it in order. That's a time constraint. That's a problem. You have to make sure that your systems are capable of taking that first service pack, and you have to be able to have it on hand and available. Or this. When you do testing, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to name. <laughs> I've sat across from people and had some heated discussions about why you need to test your patch in a separate environment beforehand. Because if it breaks something, you're going to really hate yourself the next morning. And it will go wrong. It can go wrong. And freaking guaranteed, if you decide to just put it out on the production system or adjacent to the production system, it is going to go wrong. Murphy is going to be right there. Who here wishes they had a test environment in place? I, I know people who have. I did, I've done security assessments. And then, yeah, you really need to be able to coordinate that agreement for downtime and speak to the stakeholders. This all takes a lot of time and negotiation and patience. There are a lot of prematurely bald people out there. This is a wig. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, the proverbial road to hell. Okay, we need patching, yes, but we also need to be ready for what goes wrong. So we need to have rollbacks in place and countermeasures because stuff is going to happen. And I feel like I can't say this enough. It's that ounce of, prep, of preparedness, right? It's so much worth it because you don't want to have to deal with a pound of flesh that is going to literally be the, the cure. If you've lived through a bad patch Tuesday, and really, who hasn't? When stuff goes wrong, it gets ugly. I've been on those triage calls because with Windows, <laughs> sometimes it isn't just one month of bad patch Tuesday. Sometimes it's as many as three successive months. And from experience, it isn't as easy as just rolling it back. So you've got customers, and their business takes a hit. For business, this becomes the hard argument in terms of dollars and risk, why they are not going to agree to your idea of a patching schedule. They're going to insist on their own. Now let's talk about visibility, which is crucial. I've got five W's here that we need to ask ourselves and be able to answer. It's really important. We're going to talk about the who, the what. Do you know what your crown jewels are? I'm talking about people who do not know what those are or where they are, who can't say what's being used and when and by whom. This is a big one. You can't find what you're looking for when you need to fix it. It's not logged or cataloged anywhere. And of course this, which should just be a, a standard rule for everybody, least privilege. You don't need everybody having access to all of the things all of the time. OK. So a lot of security professionals see the problem in terms of visibility that we can't see from end to end across all of the different sections in IT. And we know that we have a problem in terms of working with silo mentality, and we don't communicate well. Well, if you can't see what all of your assets are, how do you secure what you're not aware of? You can't patch what you don't know is there. If you don't see all of the endpoints, you're going to miss stuff. So from experience, and I'm sure some of you have lived through this as well, when you have to go chase down equipment within your organization because you've been notified and now your, C, your CEs, the C-suite, have been notified of a high-level critical 10 vulnerability, a planet killer, right? They're all over you. They're not paying attention, it seems, like any other time. But right now, they are breathing down your neck, and you have got to find this and patch it. Except you can't find it because it's you don't have up-to-date records that there is a catalog system, but it is convoluted at best, and you do not even know where to look. And so you, you do the only other thing you've got, which is you, you start 
phoning people and asking them. And they sure as hell don't want to speak to you because you're interrupting their day. And they're really short-tempered. This is not a solution. I have a two-word solution for you. Asset management. Please. <sighs> All right, so what do you do when you can't patch? Mitigations. Yes. Yes, there is hope, and they are effective. One of them, I love the idea. How about this? Virtual patches. It'll buy you time. And that's what you want. You want to close that window of opportunity when a vulnerability is made public knowledge and the attackers are building exploits, because then you can actually get to work on putting a real patch in place and not be the lowest hanging fruit. So I will sit with this. Security is not a Band-Aid solution. What it should be is a process that is in line with the needs and the objectives of a specific organization with your organization. So it behooves us to understand more about where we are working and what's driving that business. Why? Because Patching needs to be an integral part of the ongoing business process. And we want to get that C-level buy-in. So we have to work with them better by understanding more about what they are trying to do. Then we're going to be actually able to broker some meaningful discussions and achieve, I would like to think, a little more flexibility, but definitely create for them a business case to commit to giving us time, money, and resources so that we can do this better. Because if we want to help management hear the message, well, then we've got to write a new prescription for patching. It's time for a second opinion. Thank you all very, very much for coming. Um, are there any questions? All right. All right. Go enjoy the rest of the talks and the con. Thank you.